Well, hello and welcome to Rare Classic Cars for another Porch Chat. Today on the Best of Worst of series, we're going to feature one of my favorite Ford engines of all time. The 385 series or the 429 and 460 cubic inch engines. And by the way, yes, there was a 370 cubic inch 385 series engine in commercial vehicles. However, let's focus on the 429 460 as that's what most people are familiar with. So first things first, this is Ford's longest production big block engine produced from 1968 until 1998 when it was superseded by the Triton V10 engine. We can debate whether or not that was a good choice uh, based on the reliability of that engine versus this one. But in any event, it was in production a long time in Lima, Ohio, hence sometimes you hear it's called the Lima engine. You'll hear 385 because on the 460s it was introduced stroke on the motor was 3.85 inches. Now the bore on these is always uh, 4.36 inches. No matter what the size is, the stroke does change. So the 385 series name is, could be a bit of a misnomer, obviously, as the stroke changes between the various engines. But this motor, perhaps, you know, more than others, really exemplifies if you've watched my other videos, I extol the virtues of full-size cars and luxury and near-luxury cars and getting, I would say, a big motor, a great engine for a great price. This engine was used in Mustangs and Cougars, and yes, they did have you know, more powerful versions of it in the Mustang with north of 11 to 1 compression ratios, so I will give you that. But the basic fundamentals and internals were the same when it was dumped into a Lincoln or into a Mercury mid-year through 1972 or later, or a Ford. And so you're getting a great engine to power your full-size vehicle for, you know, if this engine were in a Mustang and you bought the luxury car with a 460, you might be getting a, in the price differential. You might pay a fifth of what the Mustang would be to get the luxury car. So why not get the luxury car? And you could always, you could spend that price differential if you want on souping up the motor a little bit. These are really easy to get some more power out of if you want, particularly if you get one from 1973 or later, but you're starting with a really good fundamentally sound engine. So the other thing to note about this is it is a heavy engine. It's heavy, it's 700-ish pounds, 720 pounds, but believe it or not, it's lighter than what it replaced. The Ford FE or Ford Edsel, engines and the MEL, the Mercury Edsel Lincoln engines. So in spite of being heavy, it is lighter, did use thin wall castings. Nonetheless, very durable, very reliable. These engines do have uh, forged connecting rods. They have two bolt mains, you know, in general for the luxury cars. And they don't have forged crankshafts, so the Mopar people might pick on you because the 440s for a lot of their run had forged crankshafts, and these do not. But they're also not a high RPM engine. You don't want to, there's no sense in revving this thing to north of 5,000 RPMs. It's a torque motor. This is a motor for driving around town, the city, cruising on the freeway, and just real enjoying yourself. And when it was introduced, the four, let's take the 460 to begin with. It was introduced for Lincolns in 1968 and uh, made its way into the Continentals and the Marks. The Mark III is introduced for 1969 model year. This engine was rated about 365 gross horsepower, and the 460 was a Lincoln exclusive until midway through 1972 when it started proliferating into the Ford lineup. And then the 429 was dropped after the 1973 model year, and the 460 you could get in Fords, Mercury's, and Lincoln's. But really started life as this 460 in the Lincoln's. And then it had the 429 variant as well, as I said, that found its way into first the Thunderbird um, and proliferated its way into Mustangs and other Ford vehicles, including the trucks. So in 460 form, I would say, you know, like I said, it was a Lincoln exclusive until midway through 1972. And it, if you get a Lincoln with this, particularly like my Mark III, the early years of these engines, the high compression years, are amazingly smooth. Uh, and I have, a lot of my cars have stock exhaust systems, so whether they are high compression or the later low compression, 
Ford switched to in 1972, I do have the stock exhaust set up on a lot of them. And for whatever reason, the low compression ones are still smooth, but they're not as smooth as the high compression uh, 429s and 460s from years earlier. It's not to say they're bad. They're just, if you get one in a 69 or 70 or 71 Mark III, or even my 71 uh, Mercury Marquis Brome as an example, wow. Silent, quiet, you don't hear anything. Even when you floor it, you barely hear a hushed roar at best. And then in later years, they get a little bit noisier, a little bit less refined, but I mean, they're still very, very refined engines, even in low compression form. And that low compression came in in 1972. And I will say one thing to be wary of today is in 1972 only, they have a unique head design that was redone in the 1973 model year because it just wasn't a great design. They were trying to get low compression quickly. And today, even if it's low comp even though the 72s are low compression, they do have a tendency to have spark knock and pinging if you don't use premium fuel or retard the timing versus stock specification. So I just wanted people to know that, that uh, one of the things that I talk about is, yes, some of these late 60s engines have more horsepower and you know even have more horsepower up until for Ford, the 1971 model year. And in 1972, they go to low compression, they drop the horsepower a little bit. And some people like that. They would prefer to have the low compression engine because now you're not worrying about filling up with premium fuel at today's prices, adding the lead additive, sometimes even having to put a few gallons of racing gas in. So it's a lot less headache. But for the 72s, I have quite a few 72 Ford products with this 385 series engine, and I do still run premium in them, just because they have a tendency to spark knock, especially on warmer summer days, if you're coming off the freeway and the, all the engine internals are pretty hot. So something to be aware of. The 73s and later don't have that issue. Although the 73s and later do have, a, I won't call it an issue, but they do have retarded cam timing by about six degrees for emissions reasons. And you know you could put it in a 197, uh, I'll say an earlier cam timing set into those engines and get back some of the horsepower. But for my money, I don't notice I have a 70, I have a number of these post 72, 460s. Do I notice a big power drop? I don't admittedly have any from 75 to 78 anymore. Uh, I just view the Ford's last best year in the 70s was 1974, personal opinion. I still like the 75 to 8 cars, but I think the bean counters were really starting to get at them. Less sound deadening, cheapening of materials more commonizing of parts. They're just not quite as special to me as the, as the earlier 70s Fords. But I don't notice really any power difference in my 73s and 4s versus the 72s. You're going to be just fine. But I just wanted you to know that that is something that also happened. And, you know, this, uh, I will say, in terms of issues, every engine has some issues. The ones for this are relatively minor. And I would say, what should you look out for? This is not a, I have never had one of these engines need a new head gasket or major internal work. Uh, at, at, you know, really what the issues that I've had are water pump bearings. They're not really robust <coughs> in this engine. And, you know, not, not quite sure what the deal is there. But one thing I would check is if you're going to buy one of these, grab a hold of the fan and jiggle it and see if you feel play in the fan. And if you do, that means your water pump bearings are going, or certainly if you hear a growling noise, uh, you're gonna have to replace it. And that's not a fun job on these. They've got the pump, a gasket, a spacer, a gasket, the timing cover. The bolts are not really hardened, so they can have a tendency to snap. My best advice there is try to use your impact wrench on a low, low torque setting to begin with and just jostle the bolt you know, repeatedly, trying to get it to start to come out. Don't put your impact wrench all the way on high and crank it up, and then you're gonna snap the bolt off. So try that first. You can obviously try some heat. Uh, if you have a ven Venom mini ductor that can heat up the bolt itself and not the surrounding area, those are excellent tools. They're expensive as heck. I think they're five, $600. But for these, if you do a lot of water pumps on these cars, they're a great tool. 
Um, but yeah, the water pumps aren't fun. They're a common failure point. And the gasketing between that timing cover and water pump and the spacer, sometimes they leak there. These do have, like other engines of the time, rear main seal leaks. I could see that for almost any of these 60s, 70s cars. If it's dripping a few drips, you know, every a couple weeks to a month, you're fine. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, if you're puking out oil on the floor, then yes, you definitely have to worry about it. Other thing I would say, particularly in the early years, and for whatever reason on the passenger side, the exhaust manifolds tend to crack. I had to replace the one in my, my Mark III, and it's a low mileage car at the time. I think it had 28,000 miles, but you could hear the of the exhaust leak. And at the time, it was relatively easy. I think I found one on eBay, and it's been fine ever since. But the early ones do have some exhaust manifold problems. And also, I would say another issue, not specific to the engine itself, but some of these have flex fans. And Fords in particular were known for the flex fans breaking and shearing off. You want to be very, very careful if you're working under a hood and you've got a flex fan engine. Like my 72 Continental has a flex fan. Interestingly, some of the lower end cars like the Mercury's and Ford's had a declutching fan. It was not a flex fan. My Continental has a flex fan. I, why on that car? Why that? You know, I don't know. But you want to inspect that flex fan frequently and make sure it does not have any cracks and make sure that you're not working on it with a motor in, you know, running, having not inspected that flex fan. Because the last thing you want is one of those blades to fly off and hit you and injure you. So be very, very careful. Inspect your flex fan. And that goes for not just, these, those flex fans were not just used on the, on the 385 series engine for Ford. So if you got a 351M or a 400 or whatever it is, check your flex fan and don't let, operate it if it's got a crack. Replace it. Other thing on these, again, not specific to the engine, but specific to how a customer would perceive the drivability is, unfortunately, they are topped with the Motorcraft or Autolite 4300 or 4350 carburetor, which... <laughs> bad news yes i operate a lot of these cars yes i probably have i don't know more than 10 cars with that carburetor and i do operate them but i know their tweaks and the and how to get them running better and their quirks and i will say even after i do that they're not a great carburetor you know they just weren't everything from bogginess to poor accelerator pumps to uh, hard to start when cold, to flooding out, issues with secondary needles and seats, issues with if you floor it and back off the throttle, the secondary throttle plate sticking open. They're just not good carburetors. Like I said, that said, I operate them, and for me they're fine, but I understand their quirks, and I can get them running pretty well. And for me that's part of the fun, getting something that didn't work well all that great to begin with to work better would i recommend that to the average person if you want the best drivability and, and having it for starting no i would dump an edelbrock on there or something like that it will be better for you in general and it will have more responsiveness the the motorcraft and auto light carburetors really don't have much throttle response until you start tipping into the throttle more than a third of the way and then the power piston or power valve starts to kick in and you get a richer mixture but the Edelbrocks, you'll notice you have instant throttle response, better accelerator pumps, richer mixtures um, at, the, at the lower uh, throttle tipping as well. And, you know, really aside from that, those are niggles, I would say. This, this engine is a robust, reliable workhorse. The other thing I will say is don't over tighten your oil drain plug, particularly on these early 460s and 429s unless you want to strip it out or strip the oil pan out so make it snug but don't take your wrench you know your ratchet and go and put all your force behind it you're going to strip something that was a known issue and whether it's in a car or a truck so just make it snug and you're fine don't over tighten it but all things considered this is one of my favorite ford engines it's it's really smooth especially in high compression years it does its job well, almost forgettably under the hood. It has good power, yes, in the 70s, 
were they making, you know, people are going to say, oh, it's a 7.5 liter 460 cubic inch engine with, in some cases, less than 200 horsepower or barely over 200 horsepower. You know what, when you drive one of these vehicles, it doesn't feel that way. You accelerate off the line with great speed, with, you know, pushing yourself in the seat back, and they have great torque. Now, if you, you slam on the gas and you go to pass somebody and you're expecting your 4,500, 5,000 pound car to get up and gain speed really quickly, no, in some cases it doesn't. Particularly, they did use two barrel carburetors on the 429s, like in my 71 Mercury Marquis. And somebody may say, a two barrel on a 429 cubic inch engine? Yes. And let me tell you, it works great. Don't mess with the Autolite 2100. It is a great carburetor and it works on these and it feels peppy. Yes, I do have a little bit of a lack of passing power at 75 miles per hour, but you're gonna be happy with the two barrel carburetor, maybe even over the four barrel carburetor on these when it was available on the 429s. So, in any case, great engine. Has a few niggles, water pumps, timing covers, uh, heads in 1972. The timing chain set is not a, uh, necessarily a problem, but it was retarded in 1973. I will mention too that these have, uh, in the earlier years, they do have plastic uh, gears for the camshaft and those can shred teeth. So you do, if you replace the water pump in particular, you do want to go the next step and replace, I would say, the timing set with an all metal set because that can, that can also be a, a problem issue for these. But on the whole, great engine, very enjoyable, highly recommend, backed by a C6 often backed by a Ford 9 inch rear. What more do you want? Get a luxury car, get a 429 460, get the C6, get a nine inch Ford rear end. Things bulletproof. You'll love it. Till next time. Hope you enjoyed Take this care. video on the Ford 385 series engines, the 429 and 460. If you did, please like and comment as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve this video up to more viewers like you. And if you're not subscribed, what are you waiting for? Click the circular icon at the top left of the Buick Riviera, then hit the bell to ensure that you are notified of all my future videos. And check out one of the two thumbnails at the bottom left and right for some videos for you. Thanks again for watching.